Joining me today is entrepreneur Gret Glier. He is the founder and CEO of Donor C, an international charitable giving platform first launched in 2016 that lets donors see the difference they make. Think Uber for a global charity uh, fundraising. Donor C has raised more than a million dollars for those in extreme poverty, has been featured by National Review, USA Today, NBC, ABC, and the Huffington Post, among others, and has been widely heralded as a dynamic private sector alternative to some of the problems in the traditional foreign aid model. Gret was inspired to start Donor C by his experience as an on-the-ground aid worker in Malawi, uh, one of the world's most impoverished countries. And he is also the author of the book, If the Poor Were Next Door, How Moving to the Poorest Country in the World Inspired a Mission to Transform Charity. Gret, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Thanks, Chelsea. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, before we get into Donor C and talking about what that is, let's talk about your experience that inspired it. You were living a comfortable life in an affluent neighborhood in Northern Virginia, so one of the nicer areas in the wealthiest country in the world. And you ended up in Sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest region of the world, and even within that, the one of the poorest countries in the world, Malawi, which uh, you say you actually hadn't even heard of uh, for much of your life. So what led you to Malawi? Yeah, I mean, that's a good preface. I spent, you know, growing up, I, I went to private school and I had, I was driving, my parents got me a, a used Dodge Stratus when I was in high school. And I thought I was poor because my friends were driving Mercedes Benz, you know, they're teenagers driving Mercedes Benz or driving like these nice SUVs. And I was driving just my Dodge Stratus a few years old. Um, and so, you know, I thought I was a, a poor person. And then um, I kind of continued through life. I went to college. I went, I spent a year in the corporate world and the corporate world was great. I, I was told that I would be fast-tracked. I was promoted very quickly, and it seemed like, a, like a, a really good opportunity for me, but I just couldn't see myself continuing down that path for another 20 years. I just thought, if, I am, if I'm doing this for the next 20 years of my life, I'm going to have a complete lack of purpose and meaning in my life. And so I wanted to do something that was and I wanted to essentially blow up my life. Like I, I wanted to do something that was just like so radical that it was it would it would reset kind of the trajectory of my life so I could see if I could find some meaning and purpose. I was really desperate to find that. And that's why I quit my job, moved to Malawi. Uh, the year I moved to Malawi was 2013. It was ranked as the poorest country in the world in 2013. And that's when my definitions of poverty and wealth were massively reframed uh, when I moved to Malawi for the first time. Right. When you arrived in Malawi, you witnessed a level of poverty that most people can't even imagine. Um, you went from one of the wealthiest areas of the world to an area where some people live on only a dollar a day. Can you sketch out some anecdotes to illustrate just uh, how much poverty still exists? Yeah, it's shocking. It, it's it's almost impossible to convey through words or even through video. Sometimes it's so so difficult. You feel like you're on. You feel like you're just almost on a different planet because the level of po you just can't imagine that the level of poverty is what is what it is. You know, I personally knew people who were living off of thirty cents a day, fifty cents a day. I still am good friends with a lot of these people. Like even though they're uh, they're so poor, they oftentimes will have some access to cell phones and stuff like that, so I can WhatsApp with them. But yeah, it's just a very different level. When I was over there, I think the very first most shocking story was there was this little girl, her name was Emily, and uh, I would go into a village every single Friday with a, kind of a, a group of my friends and a group of Malawians that I knew, and we would just hang out in the village, hang out with the people there. I'd play soccer with the kids there. It was really fun. Um, there's this little girl on the sideline. She's maybe five or seven years old. She's wearing this purple dress, and she was like rooting for everyone. She's such a like adorable little girl. And we found out uh, that she was an orphan. Um, and the story about how she became an orphan is essentially her mother got sick and her mother needed to go to the hospital, but the hospital bill was $20. 
and she didn't have twenty dollars. Twenty dollars, you know, when you're living off of a dollar a day, that's about thirty bucks a month, and the the majority of that is on food, and it's not even enough food to provide your basic sustenance. So she didn't have twenty dollars, and because of that, um, someone actually sent an email to someone in the states saying, you know, we have this situation. This person needs twenty dollars. Would you mind providing the providing twenty dollars so she can go to the hospital? You know, understandably, the guy in the states thought maybe it was a scam. You know, didn't want to donate it. And um, about six months later, that guy who was emailed like happened to be on a mission trip in Malawi. Uh, he was getting a, him and his gr crew, crew, uh, group was getting a tour of the village that Emily's mom lived in. And they saw Emily's mom. She had not been treated in six months. She was doing so bad. It just was such a terrible situation. So they their entire two week trip was completely uh, they, they decided, OK, for the for, for the next two weeks, we're going to get rid of all of her plans and we are going to help this woman because she's she's so sick um so they spent two weeks they got her a nice mattress they took her to the hospital they took her to they got her all the food and medicine that she needed and then they after two weeks they had done everything they could for her they hopped on the plane they got back home and within 24 hours emily's mom passed away so it, it was too late it was it was twenty dollars would have solved the whole problem six months earlier but at that point she had um the situation was so bad that it wasn't it was too late and so emily her father was gone. Her mother was uh, had passed away, and so Emily was an orphan, and she was being taken care of uh, in this village by her grandmother. And it was a, it was literally twenty dollars that was the different the life or death difference for this woman. Um, and to me, that's like the one that really that really stuck home with us, uh, you know, with me, um, and and the the one I really hang on to is that we we still live in a world where twenty dollars is the difference between life and life and death for certain people. Absolutely. I think many people lack that global perspective when it comes to poverty and also historical perspective. It's hard to imagine now, but that kind of absolute poverty that you were witnessing, that was the baseline condition for the majority of humanity for most of history. For centuries and centuries, day-to-day uh, -day life was very similar. Most people survived, uh, if they did survive, as subsistence farmers. Uh, they were very poor. Average income was basically flat throughout much of history. Then you got the Industrial Revolution, world GDP suddenly skyrocketing. But that kind of economic prosperity is a relatively recent innovation in human history. And today, even while poverty is at historic lows, uh, that kind of poverty does still exist in some places. And some of the efforts to change it are tragically ineffective. Returning to your experience in Malawi, uh, could you talk about how it not only opened your eyes to the problem of poverty and how extreme poverty can be, but also you saw some of the inefficiencies, the bureaucratic inertia, a lack of impact and other problems plaguing the traditional foreign aid uh, apparatus. Yeah, this is one of the great tragedies of our modern era is the is the inefficiencies in the charity sector or the, the foreign aid sector or or wherever money is, is flowing to supposedly help impoverished people, but it's not being applied effectively. It's one of the great tragedies of our modern times because amazing progress has been made like you said you know over the last 100 years the the amount of people who have access to wealth and opportunity has completely skyrocketed um there's a lot of great market dynamics that have resulted uh in that and then there's still a lot of people who are living in abject poverty that you just can't even you literally cannot imagine it until you like go and meet these people you're face to face with them and you hear their stories and you sit with them in their mud huts or whatever it is that wherever it is that they're living i mean it, you you just can't imagine how poor certain people are um when i was in in malawi specifically i remember there was this one road and on the road, it was there was a, a series of charity offices, um, and it, and the offices they were all air conditioned. They all had kind of like private security. They all had nice SUVs out front, and they were well funded, big name brand charities that you've probably heard of before. All kind of in this same row, but they all kind of hung out on their respective compounds, and they weren't spending a lot of time in the. They weren't actually spending time with people living in poverty. I mean, they would go do their quarterly visit or whatever it was, but so that they could take pictures. But there wasn't a lot of development happening. And the the thing that is, and I I think I want to emphasize, like on is it's a complex issue. On the one hand, 
um, you have just a lot of po poverty is a very, very, very complex issue, and that it's multifaceted, and you need a lot of different things to go right for poverty to be alleviated. Um, so on the one hand, some of these charities, it's, it's not all malintent. Some of it is um, inability to do anything in the situation, um, but there's just not enough transparency and not, not not enough accountability to bring some of that stuff to light. So it's a it is a big a big problem. It's one of the great tragedies of our modern era, and it's one of the things that we're extremely passionate about fixing at Donor C. Right. Uh, to expand on that, you've been critical of what you call big aid. Some of those traditional charities. Um, you've said in the past, for example. Big aid organizations are outmoded. They take a huge chunk of every donation for administration, much higher commissions than any private sector agency. And they're often better at paying their staff than at rewarding donors or designing truly impactful programs. In fact, the way the system is set up right now, you've said big aid organizations are incentivized to keep the poor in poverty and reliance on the aid, because if these organizations do a better job, they are essentially putting themselves out of work. And you've also said in the past when describing uh, so-called big aid, some of these large bureaucratic organizations again, that they should be embarrassed of how ineffective they are by how much they spend on infrastructure instead of projects. Uh, so why do you believe that funding projects, immediate needs of individuals is uh, more valuable than investment in infrastructure guided by uh, technocrats? Why are projects more effective than infrastructure? Well, it's more about the the empowerment of the local people to implement the projects effectively. That's really the most important thing. What you don't want to happen, what you don't want to have happen, is you don't want someone in an air conditioned office on the other side of the planet deciding what is being implemented on, in a country and a culture that they have no idea what is going on in there. So one of the things that we do at DonorSea is we lean heavily on the local individuals who have local relationships who understand the opportunities for impact, and they also understand the opportunities for pitfalls. Like there's a lot of potential corruption. There's a lot of things, potential for fraud. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, and what we do is we put uh, we empower the local individuals and then we just put cameras everywhere. And we want to make sure that um, the what mon that donated money is delivered effectively and in a way that, that honors donor intent, um, but also um, that there's a lot of transparency. And sometimes things don't go right and people and organizations should be honest about that. Um, and that's not actually the, the norm for a lot of these large organizations. They know that things don't go right, but they don't report it to, to donors because it's an awkward conversation. Like, I'm not even saying I blame them. I'm saying it's a it's a tough dynamic to navigate. Um, but people, that that's what donors deserve. They deserve to have full transparency about how their money was used, even in the instances where sometimes it's not used effectively. And I think donors, you know, at donors, we always, we always do our best to report when things don't go right or if things, you know, if, if a situation works out uh, differently than we hoped it would. And from our experience, donors really value that. They actually trust us more because we tell them when things don't go well. And then they, they want to give through us because they know if uh, good or bad, we're going to let them know how it goes. Right. That kind of decentralized model where you're getting information on the ground, you're able to respond to people's needs definitely sounds better than a technocrat miles away ordering supplies that might not be needed. I, I've heard you right. I've heard you talk about uh, seeing an entire uh, storeroom filled with shoes that were delivered uh, to uh, you know help the poor, but they were never actually distributed because it turns out those shoes, that was not what was needed, but it was divorced from those sorts of market signals. And in other interviews, I've seen you cite uh, the book When Helping Hurts and the documentary Poverty Inc. as influences on your thinking and summaries of some of the problems that you've witnessed in your work in Malawi and Haiti and elsewhere about the ways in which philanthropic enterprises are sometimes run. Um, I would add to that for people who are interested in learning more about this topic, William Easterly's The Tyranny of Experts, uh, The Poverty of Development Economics by Deepak Lal, and Descent on Development by Peter Bauer. It's older, but it's a good book. And uh, for a more uplifting view of what's going right instead of just what's going wrong when it comes to economic development around the world, uh, my colleague Marianne Tupi's book, 
10 global trends every smart person should know and many more that you will find interesting has some beautiful data on some of the ways in which poverty is declining in many places and in the world on average as a whole and of course on humanprogress.org we try to analyze the causes of lasting prosperity and economic development and the best policies and institutions to reduce uh, poverty. Are there any other resources that you would recommend for people who want to learn more about this? Yeah, absolutely. There's one that I would, so like a little bit of a less academic one, but I think really gets, helps people, you know, I, like I said, it's almost impossible to understand poverty. Like it's really difficult if, you know, I'm here in my air conditioned office talking through the internet to you and your air conditioned office. Um, and the, most of the people uh, watching this or listening to this, that's going to be a normal experience for them. But how do you understand the experience of someone who lives off of a dollar a day, who doesn't have three square meals a day, who doesn't have a refrigerator, who doesn't have a kitchen, who um, has like, you know, in Malawi, they have uh, they have the rainy season, they have the dry season, and then they have what's called the hungry season. Like one of their seasons is literally called the hungry season because that's when the crops are not quite ready to be harvested yet. And so the, a lot of people are hungry during that time and the uh, crime rate goes up. So like, how do you understand that? How do you understand that? So I always point people to a really great movie um, that was that's on Netflix. It's called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And it's actually of a of a boy in Malawi, um, and I, I'll let people watch it, um, but it's about a, a boy from a, a very rural village who found, this is a true story, found a, a textbook and was able to do some cool things because he found the textbook and was just showed a lot of ingenuity. Um, and that, that boy ended up attending the same school that I taught at for a year in Malawi, not at the same time, but just kind of a, an interesting personal overlap between me and that, that boy. Um, but it's a really, it, the movie does an incredible job of helping you feel like you helping you feel the pain and the difficulty that they go through. It's very, very well done. So I highly encourage people to watch The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. And there's a book that accompanies it as well. Uh, so those uh, those problems and the depths of poverty inspired donor C. And you sort of touched upon this, but you were also inspired by your experiences fundraising for a girl's school in rural Malawi. Uh, there's a great mini documentary about this on your website, uh, but for those who are unfamiliar with the story, could you walk us through it and how that experience uh, led you to getting the idea for donor C? Definitely. So when I first moved to Malawi, um, I actually, my, my job there was I was a, a, a teacher at an international school. So I was teaching pre-calculus and algebra two. That was my foot in the door to move to a country like Malawi. And it was a great opportunity for me. But what I, what I wanted to do was get more involved in more humanitarian efforts. Like I, you know, I was at teaching at this international school, but then it was like, I'm teaching the 1%. So it's, you know, I, I wanted to know what I could do to get involved with what some people refer to as the bottom billion, like the people who really um, are at the in the most vulnerable positions in a, on our entire planet. So I started doing these little crowdfunding projects. So I, I started off with little with um, I think the first one of the first ones was like fifty dollars to provide a baby with formula milk, and and I would post it on YouTube, and I'd have a WordPress website with a PayPal link, and people would donate fifty bucks, and then they would we would give the baby formula milk, and they could see the baby kind of get nursed back to health. And then we did three hundred dollars to provide a family with a, a pigsty, which that provides a sustained source of income for the family. It gives them the ability to breed the pigs and have the pigs and and, and raise the the piglets. Um, and it's a great way to provide that kind of sustained de development. And it just get, got bigger and bigger. So then I remember thinking, let me do something really crazy. I'm going to raise nine thousand dollars to provide um, a mosquito net for every person in this village. And the mosquito net fundraiser, uh, so the, the, the stat there is whenever a village is covered in mosquito net, whenever 70% of the village uh, sleeps under a mosquito net, the malaria rate in the village goes down by 90%. Malaria is a huge problem in the developing world, and you're saving lives by um, by by giving out these these nets and training people on how to sleep under them. So that so then and it, it just the projects kept getting funded. So then I um, decided, well, what's like the, what's something else I'm really passionate about that could make a really big lasting impact? So I actually wanted to build a clinic and um, I thought building a maternity clinic would be a really cool way to kind of um, do the next fundraiser. And so I started talking to different local Malawians and they all told me like it's 
it's not a good idea. Uh, as 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 nice as it is, what's going to happen is you're going to build a clinic, but then you're going to have to fund the staffing and you're going to have to fund um, just the ongoing expenses. And it's going to turn into an empty building within three or four years. We've seen it happen a hundred times. So I was really resistant to their feedback because I was so you know bullish on making this clinic. I was so, I just really wanted to make it happen. But eventually uh, they persuaded me that it would be better. You know, I started asking all the Malawians. Again, it's so important to talk to the local people, understand like they know what they need. And I and I got basically a unanimous. Everyone unanimously told me what we need is girls' education. They all know that they need that to educate women um, and edu educate young girls in the country because there's a massive gender disparity gap in in Malawi. Um, so I put together a fundraiser. I worked with a local woman named Tia, who was the kind of it was her. She had been dreaming of building this school for seven years. She had all of the architecture plans, all of the curriculum, everything was ready to go. She just needed $100,000 to build the school. And so over the course of a few months, we put together a fundraiser and like in piece by piece, we built this, uh, we, we, we first we fundraised the, um, the excav excavated the ground, then the foundation, then the walls, then the roof. And it just kept going until we had the whole entire building. And there were 120 girls that attended that first year. And there's over 300 in attendance today. It's a fully sustainable girls school. Like we don't have to provide any ongoing expenses because we have um, tuition that comes from half the students and the other half of the students are vulnerable girls. I mean, it's like an amazing thing that was done. And I was just there last October to go visit it. And it's like every year I go there, they add to it and they do cool things with it. And there's these girls being educated. And I think that the most recent class had a 70% attendance rate in college, which is these are girls from like very rural areas. Their parents don't even know how to read um, and they're getting a college education now. So it's an amazing thing that happened. And, uh, you know, I, I was a part of it, but there was a lot of people who were a part of it that made it happen. So it's a really cool initiative. That's remarkable. Um, you've already touched on this, but how is Donor C working to change the status quo with, you know, a market solution to transform charity as the subtitle of your book uh, puts it? How exactly does the platform work for people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so the platform really focuses on the donor experience. That's It's a minor innovation, but it's a really important one to focus on making sure that the donors are having a good experience when they donate. I always say, you know, you can have a bunch of guilty, depressed people donating, but at the end of the day, those people are going to give one time and they're going to disappear. What you want is people who are who have satisfying giving experiences so that they get they get more invested, they get more involved, they give more often, they tell their friends about the opportunity to give. So we're we're obsessed with the donor experience at Donorcy. And um, you know, what are a few of the innovations that we have is whenever you give, you you can go on the donorcy.com, you can pick out a project, and anyone who, you know, any project that you pick out, you you get to see exactly who you're helping. Your donation goes to that person, and then you get a video update showing you how your donation helped. And there's like some really incredible if you you follow our TikTok or our Instagram, we have a TikTok video that's going viral right now. It has a million views of a man who's getting a wheelchair. We have a lot of these kind of like really power, emotionally impactful stories. And the reason they're emotionally impactful is because they are tr like the person receiving the charity, receiving the gifts, they're, they're so happy to, to get those, to get the benefit of the wheelchair or the hearing aids or the glasses or the, or the school tuition or the school uniform or whatever it is that, that it is. And you get to see the difference that you make in that person's life. Um, and it's, it's amazing. And then we also have, uh, you know, for people who don't want to go to the trouble of picking out a project, um, we also have a opportunity to give monthly. So this is my one of my favorite things, especially we live in the, the D.C. area. So like everyone's busy, everyone's got too much to do um, and everyone wants their stuff automated. So you can go to donorc.com slash monthly and you can sign up to give monthly. And every month you're like you could sign up to give 20 bucks a month as an example. Like that's the, that's a life or death difference for a lot of people. Every month, your 20 dollars will go to a different project. And then we'll send you video updates every single month showing you how your 20 dollars helped every single month. And it's like an amazing it's it's an amazing thing to see, like. You, you think $20 doesn't matter because like for you and me and for most people watching this, $20 could disappear out of, you know, out of their bank account. They would have no clue. But for the people who are receiving it, it, it is a massive, huge difference in their life and you get to see it. And I, I believe that that kind of like focusing on giving, like showing the donor the impact that they're making, I believe that that's going to change the world. And you've built this platform, DonorC, from... The ground up and out has a staff of 10 or so, I think, and you're expanding. You're actually hiring more, a web developer, I believe, right now, and some other roles maybe. And it's it's really a remarkable achievement. Congratulations. And it wasn't easy to get to that 
to this point, correct? You faced a lot of challenges in 2017. Uh, there was some press uh, relaying that the Peace Corps actually banned their volunteers from using Donor C, uh, citing federal regulations and threatened to actually fire any aid worker who used uh, Donor C. And there were there were numerous other challenges. Anyone who hasn't tried to start a business or a nonprofit or any other kind of uh, official organization probably doesn't even realize how much red tape, how much bureaucracy there is involved uh, with these things. Can you describe some of the legal and regulatory uh, hoops that you had to jump through to bring donor C to the point where it is today? Yeah, I'll tell you the one that still makes, you know, I even get emotional thinking about it. It makes me so mad. I cried the, mm -hmm. the day it happened. And like, you know, it's such a personal thing to me. I really care about what we're building here. I really care about our staff. Mm -hmm. I care about our team. I care about the people who are being helped. I care about our partners implementing stuff on the ground. Um, and when we first started Donorcy, we were actually an app for a mobile app first platform. And so it was really great. You could make a donation through the app and, and your donation would go to people and you get a video update and it was all in real time. It was, it was really wonderful. Um, and then I think it was in 2017 or 2018, uh, Apple, um, they wanted to launch their new Apple Pay uh, product where you know, it's like their credit card processing product. Um, and so because of that, they decided that charities had to use Apple Pay um, to process their donations. Well, because of the way our model works, we can't use Apple Pay. We have to use Stripe because we're, we get money directly to the individual organizations that are distributing the money. So we can't use Apple Pay. We have to use Stripe. Um, and so because of that, um, over we like our our mobile app, which again, you know, I funded the first mobile app personally, and then I recruited some uh, funding so I could build the, the mobile app. But it was like, it was everything. Our, our iOS app was where 60% of our donation volume was going through and overnight that disappeared sometime in 2017, 2018. I, I cried. I was like so upset. I couldn't believe that Apple would do this. We appealed it. Um, we, we, we talked to the press about it, but they released an article on, I think like December 23rd, you know, everyone's like checked out when that happened. So, um, yeah, it almost, I mean, that almost killed us. That, that was, that set us back probably two or three years. It was terrible. And, um, it's one of those things where, I still somehow through all of that, through how difficult that was, I still, I really believe it's going to work out if I just like hang on. And, you know, so I think that's one of the things, if you really believe what you're doing and you just like hang on and like find a way to do it, it probably will work out. And like now we're at this place where we, you know, we, yeah, we have a little over 10 staff. We're probably going to be doubling that this year. Um, and we've raised uh, close to $5 million in funding for people. And these are with very small projects. Um, you know, these are like $200, $300 projects. Um, so we've just, we've been able to touch a lot of lives. We sent over 27,000 videos to donors. Um, these like super happy videos. Now we've got like our TikTok is taking off, our Instagram is taking off. We got a lot of good stuff happening, but that was a tough moment. And anyone who started anything knows that you go through those moments and, and they're not fun. Yeah, your perseverance is uh, admirable and that... <sighs> The issue with um, the Peace Corps must have been very difficult too, right? Because that's one of the biggest, possibly the biggest, I'm not sure, aid worker organizations. So that was a lot of your potential um, you know, base for people starting projects. I wasn't able to find a lot in the media about how that situation resolved, but the fact that basically regulations prevented them from being able to uh, adopt this app is, well, ridiculous to me. What, what happened with that? I mean, there's they're still not able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. The only thing I think is going to happen is I think it I think it will get fixed. I don't know how exactly, but I think it's going to get fixed. Um, I think it will be inevitable at some point. Like you can't just continue to not have um, transparency on your activities. And I, I just think that there's going to be a mounting pressure over time. So I think it will get fixed. I hope so as well. I think that it can take a while for the regulatory framework to catch up to new technology startups like yours. And there's also the possibility that uh, maybe some of the more entrenched aid organizations feel threatened by a new innovation, a new model uh, to do some of these things, perhaps. Um, switching gears a bit, could you tell me about Donor C's response to the pandemic, the pandemic and the response to the pandemic, some of the global supply chain issues and so forth have been uh, very devastating, especially to uh, 
you know, very poor areas of the world. And one thing you've been very vocal about has also been the effect of uh, government lockdowns in sub-Saharan Africa and other poor countries with regards to poverty and health. And I'd be really interested in your thoughts on that as well as uh, what DonorC is doing uh, to help with all of that. Yeah, this is one of the the most frustrating things. I Like I remember, this is like, I don't cry off. I know it sounds like I cry all the time. I really don't cry off in this. I cried for this too. And I like, I, I'm serious. I, it's not like a common thing for me, mm-hmm. but I remember, um, like I remember the pandemic happened, you know, at, at the beginning, it was a very, everyone like had no idea what was happening. We thought that COVID had like a three or 4% death rate and it was spraying super quick. It was just a really scary time for a lot of people. And it still ended up being very serious. Um, but the response, you know, you I don't even want to get into the response in like America and other developed countries. Like people can debate about that. That's fine. I'm not even going to weigh in on that. I have no I don't I want that to be a distraction from like the, the more to me, what's the more important point? Um, the, the the lockdowns that happen in certain countries like Uganda um, or uh, South Africa or Sierra Leone, the lockdowns that happened in these countries were were. Uh, I don't have like I don't even have words to describe how terrible they were. Th- th- these are not this is not the laptop class. This is not people who can just like hop on Zoom and continue their work. These are people who live hand to mouth and they locked them down. So people who um, the the amount of money that they make in a day, you know, a dollar a day, two dollars a day, that's enough. That's barely enough to feed them every single day for them and their families. And so to lock those people down, tell them to stay inside. You can't go into the city. You can't go sell your wares. You can't go um, you know, harvest the your um, your fruits and vegetables. You can't go do these. You can't go to the market. They had they they had bulldozers go to these markets and bulldoze people's. Um, people's like fruit stands and where they were selling their clothes and stuff like that. They had, they bulldozed those areas to make sure that people weren't congregating there. And that's people's entire livelihood. Um, so it's really interesting. I, I, I had this prediction that the, that we would see this huge skyrocket in the, the, the malnutrition deaths for children under five. Um, for, for some reason, I don't know, I, but, but for some reason, those numbers have still not come out from the year 2020, like the, the number of children who have died from malnutrition. I've been looking for it because I've been suspecting that the numbers are just terrible. And, you know, COVID is a terrible thing and it really affects the elderly. But one of the things that the lockdowns in poor countries did is it really affected kids under five. And I just saw video after video after video after video of these kids who had been who were completely emaciated because they weren't able to to perform their their parents weren't in a position to perform uh their 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 most basic jobs and so sometimes like if the mom is malnourished and she can't feed her kid and if then the kid gets malnourished the kid's a lot more vulnerable it's a it was a terrible terrible situation um we raised Probably about fifty or sixty thousand dollars just for um, a, a clinic in Sierra Leone. We, probably, we raised another several um, tens of thousands of dollars for a clinic in um, Liberia, and these clinics were completely overrun with malnourished children. The it was it was uh, it's it's it started being two to three times the normal rate because uh, because of the, the the lockdowns. It was a, it was a terrible terrible thing that has still basically gone under the radar. Like people aren't talking about it. Um, and it's just it's it's just a weird, strange thing. And anyways, I remember, you know, I kind of had a feeling that this was starting to happen. And I, I remember kind of getting some of the videos. And I, I remember being on a walk with my wife and feeling like I feeling so powerless because I'm like, this is so unjust. But I was like, there's so there was only so much I can do. I mean, this is like this is a whole global reaction, a whole global phenomenon. I, I tried going to the press. I tried posting about on social media. It wasn't a narrative that people were interested in at the time, unfortunately. And I think eventually we'll look back on it as one of one of the most terrible things from that period. You can actually see in global development data, um, you know, what data we do have, obviously, on some indicators, we don't have new data yet to reflect what happened with the pandemic. But you can see in many cases, that trends that were headed in a positive direction, like child mortality, declining hunger, declining uh, maternal mortality rates, declining and so forth, that uh, there was a reversal uh, that will hopefully, hopefully things will return back to the positive trends. You can see also, if you look at data during the 1918 flu pandemic, the entire world uh, the life expectancy was rising and rising. And then uh, suddenly there was this huge dip in that year, but it recovered very quickly. So that was that's uh, that was the silver lining, at least. 
Yes, I hope so as well. And of course, it's not just the pandemic. There are also supply chain issues related to it. And uh, there were policy responses. Um, but moving to a different and more current event, uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, Donor C has been doing, I know, some work with Ukraine, delivering supplies there and so forth, some of your projects. But you've also been commenting publicly on the effect on sub-Saharan Africa's food supply of the war in Ukraine, which, of course, is a major wheat provider uh, for much of the world. Can you walk us through that? Yeah, definitely. So the war in Ukraine is a is a is a one of those things that is a unimaginable tragedy. Most of us you know, were so shocked by what happened when we when we first saw you know Russia taking tanks down the streets of Ukraine. I mean, you just and, and missiles going into residential buildings. It's just it's hard for us to comprehend what's going on. I we have a lot of really really great contacts on the ground in Ukraine. Um, in fact, some of our staff uh, was on the ground in Ukraine at at the beginning of the war, um, and so. It's it was we you know we this is almost like a very personal thing to us that we we know people who who live there we know people who are actively there right now doing relief work um, who we're providing funds for, and doing fundraising for them, um, so we we know we understand it very well and it is it's just a terrible thing I mean you know at Donorsi we care about the. Uh, helping the most vulnerable people in the world, and right now Ukrainians fit that category. I'm very, very sad to say to say that. I mean, it was it was such an it was such a success story in so many ways uh, up until the war happened. Um, and then, yeah, I think one of the the second order effects that is we still don't know how bad it's going to be, but there are reliable predictions from experts across the political spectrum who are pointing out that. Wheat production, both Russia and both Ukraine, uh, are they represent over eighty percent of the wheat uh, of of the wheat production that um, Sub-Saharan Africa benefits from. Um, and in fact, Malawi, it's about a hundred percent. It's crazy. The, about hundred percent of the wheat um, that Malawi gets is from Russia and Ukraine. And when you have a these these countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they're already at a calorie deficit because of the pandemic. I was there in Malawi recently, um, just just last year, and the the people in living in these impoverished, more impoverished areas, they were hit very, very, very hard. Um, so they're already kind of living at a calorie deficit. They're already living below what would be a, a healthy standard, which causes second order illnesses. And now with wheat, the wheat production drying up for them, that's not going to take effect for a few months, but it's going to hit around the same time that the hungry season hits. And some people are project projecting about 800,000 Eight hundred thousand deaths uh, from this, which again is it's one of those things. It's not even in the news. People aren't talking about it. It's outside of the the periphery of of the the normal person living in the developed world. The one thing I'm I'm hoping that we can do is provide at least provide a provide visibility over what's happening, um, so that people can see what's going on and then can respond. And it's going to take a it's going to take a large global response to address the tidal wave of malnutrition that these countries are being faced with. Well, you're certainly well positioned to help with visibility, given the you know that your platform is based around videos in large part. Um, how is you've you've talked about this a bit, but how exactly is Donor C working to enhance accountability, and transparency, and how does what is the key difference that uh, contrasts with some of the older, larger? Uh, more technocratic, philanthropic enterprises out there? I think the main innovation is the marketplace dynamics. You know, most of the time when you build an organization, you have one kind of central governing body. And then the, it, it, as the organization gets bigger, it becomes more bureaucratic, harder to manage the, you know, the on the ground individuals and harder to apply aid effectively. It just gets the bigger it gets, the more ineffective it gets. And we've just seen that happen over and over again. It's, you know, it's, it almost never doesn't happen. Um, with us, we we rely heavily on, on these marketplace dynamics. We lean heavily into the marketplace dynamics. I'm a big believer. We've seen how marketplace dynamics have revolutionized other industries. You know, Uber was a revolution in the transportation industry. Airbnb has been a, a revolution in the hospitality industry. And we believe that donor C and our marketplace dynamics will be a revolution in the charity sector as well. Um, and the reason for that is we're, we have 
charities all over the world. We partner with over 100 charities, and they are in these their respective countries. Their your donors are able to select who they give their donations to, and then they're also able to provide uh, feedback and reviews on all of the donations that they give. Um, and then the uh, the organizations all are subject to um, accountability, re regular reviews, and then what we try and do, you know, in the same way where it would be tough for Uber to manage all of the, the drivers that they have, what they do is they rely on the crowd to provide the, the, the feedback on how well people are driving. And then you can know who are the trusted people and who are not. We rely heavily on, on the crowd as well for our uh, trust, for our trust mechanisms. And then there's also a lot of great third party mechanisms out there like Charity Navigator and GuideStar um, that we also rely on to make sure that people we're bringing onto our platform are highly vetted. Um, so, but I think that the, the biggest thing is with marketplace dynamics, the beautiful thing about it, like, you know, with, U so I'll just start with Uber. With Uber, the bigger that Uber gets, the more drivers you get, the more passengers you get into that ecosystem in one city, the, uh, the faster the pickup times get and the um, lower the cost gets and the more the drivers are able to make a living out of, uh, out of that, um, out of being an Uber driver with Airbnb or with a donor seat, it's very similar. Um, at donor seat, you get to the, the more donors in the ecosystem, the more partners in the ecosystem, it creates this virtuous cycle. So literally as we get bigger, our product and what we offer to donors and what we offer to partners, it gets better over time. So that's, I mean, that's the biggest innovation is the marketplace dynamics. Right. So getting bigger can create more inefficiencies if there isn't that market information, if it's very centralized, but uh, in a more market-based structure like yours, getting bigger can actually increase efficiency. It's guaranteed to increase. Like as we get bigger, our project quality is going to get better. The the video updates that we provide are going to become more emotionally compelling. The trust that people have with giving their dollars is going to get better every single day. We've already seen this happen at the scale that we're at, going from you know 20 partners to 100 partners. But as we go from 100 to 1,000 and then 10,000 and then 100,000, it's only going to get better and better over time. So it's guaranteed to happen. Can you talk a little bit about some of that recent growth uh, that you've had? Obviously, uh, there's been a lot of uh, change since you began in 2016. You used to partner um, with individual aid workers, and now you have many more partners. It's really expanded. Can you talk about some of that growth? Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like I said, we back in 2017, that was when we kind of got hit with the Apple situation. That was a major, major setback. Um, and it, it, at that time, it was a we had a very, very lean staff. Um, and so for several years, we we're just trying. It was literally survival mode. Like I, you know, I believe this will work out. We have this like very, very basic staff that we're working with. Um, but around 2019, we really kind of figured out exactly our model. We figured out, you know, what are the things that donors really value? They value trust. They value the connection that they have with the people that they're helping. They value the immediacy. Like donor seat is the only place where all of the feedback that you're getting is real time. Like when you give to someone who needs surgery, that person needs surgery right now. And if they don't get the donation, they won't get surgery. And if they do get the donation, they'll thank you for for uh, for providing the surgery. So it's all real time, and that's something that donors really like. So kind of figuring out those dynamics, all that stuff started to click. Um, around the end of 2019, um, we hired our first, we had kind of a, a very lean staff before then. We hired our first full time employee at the beginning of 2020, outside of myself, um, and then we just started adding staff since then steadily as we've grown, and um, it's been really fun. And we're at this place where you know we have our staff. We just all got together actually here in DC. We flew all of our European staff in, our Californian staff. We flew them all into DC uh, last week, so we all got, all got to hang out with each other. And there's like a real like we feel like there's like this real energy right now about almost like the the calm before the storm. Like we really have a lot of good things that are happening all at the same time, and it's all kind of coming together. So we're at this just very exciting moment, and I'm I'm just very excited about it. Um, you've said in a recent social media post, most people take modern civilization for granted because it's all they've ever known, which is why one of the fastest ways to be happier is to simply gain perspective, hence donor C. And that mission that you described there in that quote of helping people to gain perspective regarding modern prosperity is very near and dear to my heart and the hearts of everyone on the human progress uh, team as well. How do you think donor C is helping people to gain perspective. Yeah, I think what we do is we just show the ways that 
very small amounts of money make an enormous impact. Like what the meaning it provides to other people around the world. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we have this TikTok video that's going viral. It's at about a million views right now. And it's of a man getting a wheelchair. It costs about $360 for this man to get a wheelchair. And the reason that video is going viral is because his reaction is so ecstatic and so pure like it's so genuine like this guy's thrill is an old, older man um and he's he's being carted around his village with a wheelchair and he's like waving at everyone and he's happy and his villagers are cheering him on and it's just a very very viscerally uh gratifying video that that um that you know there's a reason it's, it's going viral and so the, but when you read the comments i think there's about two thousand comments that have been left on this one video and you know we have twenty seven thousand of these videos on our platform every time you give you get one of these videos but this one video is really resonating with people so we have over we have about two thousand comments if, if you read the comments almost all the comments are people saying i'm bawling my eyes out right now i'm never going to take anything for granted again i'm going to go walk around my block because i just you know i just feel so grateful for what i have and for my ability to walk um, and it's giving people this level of perspective that's that's uh, that is it's it wasn't even possible before because there wasn't the proliferation of uh, smartphones before there wasn't the proliferation of video editing software before but now we are at this like really unique moment in history like literally in the history of the world we're at this very unique moment where sub-Saharan Africa is coming online people have smartphones even in these rural villages and we're able to to get an insight into these places in a way that we never could before you know ten years ago. There were no cell phones in these villages. And then 50 years ago, people didn't even know these places existed in many parts of the world. So now it's like we're at this really unique, we're just at this very unique moment where I think there's going to be this, this almost like global awakening of um, the, the various different degrees of lifestyles that people on, on the planet that we share live in. I think that's a great point that technology can help people uh, in the poor countries as the technology spreads, but also can help people in the rich countries to appreciate modern prosperity and that that is not necessarily the default or the norm, that terrible poverty still exists. And hopefully also that will cause people in appreciating prosperity to become curious about what are the causes or drivers of prosperity and effective ways to combat poverty. Um, so thank you so much for speaking with me, Gret. This has been really enjoyable. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please check out Gret's book, If the Poor Were Next Door, How Moving to the Poorest Country in the World Inspired a Mission to Transform Charity and check out Donorsee. Thank you, Chelsea. It was a pleasure being here. <laughs>